does it ever feel like you're living your life trying to earn the approval of other people? Like almost like you're on this big stage and you're performing in a way that's more about outward appearance than what's going on on the inside, that you're hoping to earn their applause or their approval, maybe even their love. It's more about perception than it is about reality. And so you put on this mask as part of the act that I've got this all together act, even when that's not what's going on on the inside and you're broken and hurting. And you want people to feel like you've got it all together. And and I think maybe that this need to have it all together is maybe more so now than ever before. I actually saw this uh, t-shirt that said, may your life one day be as great as it looks on Instagram. There's a certain amount of truth to that. You can get some wisdom off a t-shirt on occasion. Because we feel this need to make our life look like we've got it all together, like everything is great. And the reason is because we see everybody else's life that looks so great on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. You've probably watched uh, great spring break vacations from other people this past week while you stayed at home and worked. And one of your kids had their wisdom teeth out. (laughs) That was my spring break week this week. But you see that, and then you feel the need to act like you've got it all together. So you put your pictures out on Instagram and social media to make it look like everything is really awesome. But this pressure to keep up appearances isn't really new. And it's been a part of religion going all the way back to Jesus' day 2,000 years ago. Uh, And Jesus, we've seen for the last six weeks, he had no patience for that. He had no patience for this outward appearance, this transactional religion where it's all about following some rules and trying to do some things that look right to other people but haven't changed your heart. And so Jesus was very critical of some of the the Pharisees and the, the Jewish religious leaders because that was what they were all about. They were all about transactional relationship rather than transformational relationship. Let me explain what I mean. They were about transaction. God, if I follow some rules and I do the right ceremonies and different things, then I get to keep my position of authority. I get to have people respect me. And God, I've somehow earned your approval. But Jesus never had much patience for that. He was preaching that our relationship shouldn't be transactional. Our relationship should be transformational. It should change our very hearts. But if we're honest with ourselves, not much has changed in 2,000 years. Christianity is often very superficial, almost transactional. God, if if I go to church a certain number of times a month, and if I pray a little bit and I do these different things, then you'll let me go to heaven. Hopefully, you'll take care of my family and maybe even let my team win the Super Bowl this year. God, if I do those things, and then if things start to go south and we have some problems, then we think, okay, I need to pray a few more times because things are bad at work, and it becomes very transactional. We want something from God based on what we do. And it becomes almost a consumer transaction where we are looking for something back rather than a relationship. But true religion is not about a transaction. It's about relationship. It's about transformation. It's about the heart. And throughout this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been talking about what that looks like. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Matthew chapter 7. We're in our last week of our six-week sermon series called Upside Down, where we've been looking at Jesus' longest recorded sermon in the Bible. This sermon is called the Sermon on the Mount because he preached it on the side of a mountain. And this was early in Jesus' ministry. He uh, was just getting started, but he'd already called his 12 apostles. He'd already done some miracles. And so he had these big crowds that were following him around, listening to what he had to say. And at this point, Jesus was known as a rabbi, and the rabbis were teachers of the Old Testament law. Every rabbi had a little different take, a little different perspective on the Old Testament, and that unique take was called the yoke. And so the rabbi would have his yoke, and the followers of that rabbi, they would put on the yoke. In other words, they would follow his particular perspective, and they would take their cues from him on what the Old Testament had to say. And in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying out his yoke for the first time. But what we've seen over the last six weeks is that Jesus' yoke was completely different than anything they'd ever heard before. It it felt very upside down to his listeners. And candidly, it can feel a little upside down for us as well. All right, Jesus is gonna wrap up the Sermon on the Mount, and we're looking at that today with an illustration in Matthew 7, 
verses 24 through 27. Let's look at that together. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So he's talking now, kind of summing up, he's been talking about what it looks like to have a real relationship with God for the last several weeks. We've been talking about that, and now he's going to end with an illustration. There's two builders that build two houses that look pretty the same from the outside. If you were to drive by the two houses, you couldn't tell a difference. Both, you know, they're made out of the same stucco or brick. They both had a new coat of paint, three car garages. But on the inside, in the foundation, they were very different. You had the first man who built his house on true relationship, a transformational relationship with Jesus that changed everything about it. And he was prepared for his life to stand the test of time and prepared for an eternity in heaven. But the other builder, it, his house looked all right on the outside. It looked like everything was fine. He had it all together, but it wasn't built to last because he hadn't applied these words of Jesus. And he was still trying to live out this transactional relationship by following some rules, hoping to somehow earn God's favor and approval. I, I read about this experiment done back in 2010 by the Institute for Business and Home Safety. And what they did is they built two wood frame houses in this indoor testing facility. And these houses were very similar, but one was built with more traditional construction methods, and one had these straps that were made of steel and they would tie the roof and the walls down to the foundation. And so then they took these, they took 100 big fans and blew 96 mile an hour winds on both of those houses. And the results were pretty remarkable. The house that didn't have the the straps holding everything down to the foundation, it completely blew apart in just a few minutes. But the house that had these straps tying everything down to the foundation, it only sustained some minor, like superficial damage during this experiment. Now, the reinforced house only cost about $5,000 to build. There there were lots of findings and conclusions you can imagine based on this study, but I love how the uh, Julie Rockman, the president of the Institute, summed up the results. Here's what she said. The bottom line question you have to ask yourself is, which house would you rather live in? Pretty good question. Now, some of you may prefer and relate better to a more spiritual and theological example. There's the great Old Testament story of the the big bad wolf and the three little pigs. Remember that one? So the three little pigs, one built a house out of straw, one out of sticks, and the two pigs, because they built out of straw and sticks, they played and danced and sang all day. The third pig, he built his house out of bricks, and so he had to work all day. But as the two pigs were out dancing and singing, the wolf comes up, sees them, they run into their house. The wolf goes first to the house made of straw, and he huffs and he puffs and he blows the house down. So that little pig, scared, runs out, runs to the house made of sticks, and the wolf goes there and he huffs and he puffs and he blows the house down. And the two little pigs run to the house made of bricks, and the Big bad wolf, he goes and he huffs and he puffs and he huffs and he puffs and he can't blow the house down. And I think the little pigs had to ask themselves, what kind of house would you rather live in? Now, some of you guys are going, I didn't know that was in the Old Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. (laughs) But, But it does illustrate a similar truth to what Jesus is saying to wrap up his Sermon on the Mount. If we put the effort and the energy and the sacrifice into building a house, building a life, that is built on a firm foundation, it'll weather the storms and stand the test of time. A lot of Bible scholars believe that the Sermon on the Mount probably lasted about two to three days. And during this entire time, Jesus is challenging their perception of religion. He's challenging their perception that you have a transactional religion where you follow some rules and you do some right ceremonies and then you get God's approval and you get the approval of other people. And he's saying, instead, it's about relationship. It is about transformational relationship that changes your heart. And then he wraps it up with this illustration of these two builders. He says, you got the one guy that builds a house. It's built to last by transformation on Jesus' words. The other house is transactional. It's just built on some rules, and it's not built to step, last the step, the test of time. And so Jesus is challenging his listeners to say, which kind of house do you want to live in? And he's challenging us the same way today as well. So what does it look like 
to have a transformational relationship with Jesus? What does it look like to go from following some rules, trying to be good enough, and instead be completely transformed? It's simple, but it's not easy. Put Jesus first. That's it. That's how simple it is. But it's not easy. It's build your foundation. Build the foundation of your life on Jesus and then build everything else up from there. Jesus is the most important thing in your life. That's what it looks like. I I think about it like like a dress shirt. I used to wear a lot of suits. I don't wear suits as often anymore because I don't want to. But back when I did and I'd get dressed early in the morning, I'd start putting on that dress shirt. And if I started buttoning the buttons kind of in the middle... A whole lot of times I'd get off and the buttons would be out of order and my shirt would be all cattywampus, which is an East Texas term. It means it was all messed up. But if I started at the very top and I got that first button right, everything else seemed to fall into place. And the same thing is true in our lives with Jesus. If we get Jesus in his right spot at the priority, at the very foundation of our lives, it makes everything else go a little easier. Everything else seems to fall into place. If you want your marriage to get better, put Jesus first. Did you know that there was a Gallup survey done a number of years ago that found out that couples that pray together every single day have a divorce rate of less than 1%. Less than 1%. The average divorce rate in America is almost 50%. But the reality is most Christian couples don't pray together on a regular basis. And so the Christian divorce rate is not much different than the general divorce rate. If you want your marriage to work, begin to live out, put Jesus first, and then love one another like Jesus. When I'm counseling with couples who are struggling, one of the first things I'll tell them is make sure Jesus is first. Put Jesus first. And and so a lot of times they'll start to pray together. They'll start going to church and serving and working together and, and, and doing things together to serve Jesus. And what they find is that their marriage starts to improve. And what's happening is they're putting Jesus first and they're starting to be transformed to look more like Jesus. So they're loving one another with Jesus' sacrificial love. And so their marriage will start to improve. But after a while, they get to a place where marriage is pretty good, things are feeling pretty good, and they go right back to doing things the way they were doing them before. They quit going to churches often, they quit praying together, and then suddenly their marriage gets in trouble again and they'll ask me, what went wrong? And I tell them, you got to put Jesus first again. But what I want to say is, what do you think was going to happen? Right? You were building a house that you want to live in, and when everything started getting better, then you went right back to the things that weren't working before. But do you see how they view that as a transactional relationship with Jesus? They needed Jesus to fix their marriage, so they pray a little more. They do a little more church. They do a little more service. But then when Jesus fixes their marriage, the transaction's over. And so they go right back to what they were doing before, and it doesn't work. This two-builder illustration works for marriage, but it also works for other things. It works for your family. It works for your job. It works for struggles with health conditions. If you put Jesus first, everything else will go a little easier. Now, we're not putting Jesus first so that it will fix everything in our life. We're putting Jesus first because he deserves to be first. Because he is the creator of the universe. Because he made us and then he died to save us. He is worthy of being first in our life. But when we do that, we find that all the other pieces seem to fall into place. But, but so often, we don't have Jesus where he's supposed to be. We, we really only pray when we're in trouble, when things aren't going well. And we need his help. And so we pray to fix problems at work or our marriage or our family or help us with this health condition. You see how transactional that is? Our our relationship is built on a need, something we want from God. But our faith, our religion shouldn't be transactional. It should be transformational. Look at what Jesus says back in verse 24. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man. In other words, you don't just hear this upside down message from Jesus, but you apply it in your life. You begin to make changes in your life. And through that process, you're transformed. Everything has changed about you. You've seen, probably seen me say this before, and you've seen this little equation I like to use that kind of says the same thing, but it's easy to remember, and I like to use it. Information plus application equals transformation. In other words, you get some new information, this upside down message in the Sermon on the Mount, You apply it in your life, 
And through that application, you're transformed. You're completely changed. And that's how it works. But if we're completely honest, so many of us really don't want a transformational relationship. We kind of want a no-strings-attached relationship with Jesus where it's really more of a consumer transaction, where it's an arm's-length negotiation. God, look, here, I'm going to do a few things for you. I'm going to pray a little bit. I'm going to go to church every once in a while. And, and I get to go to heaven when I die in my sleep at 147 years old, and you're going to take care of everything. But that's not how it works. Jesus has no interest in a transactional relationship with you. He doesn't. He wants a relationship that turns you upside down, that changes every single about you. Look at how he says this in Luke 9, 23 through 25. These are Jesus' words. These aren't mine. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Now listen how upside down this is. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? It's tough teaching from Jesus. It's upside down teaching. It doesn't seem right. But he's saying, do you want to be my follower? Do you, do you want to be a Christian? then the way you do that is you deny yourself. You die to your own desires and you replace them with my desires. And then you take up your cross daily and follow after me. He wants a real relationship that transforms everything about us. He's not interested in a transactional relationship where we follow a few rules and he does what he's supposed to do. So let's break down these words of Jesus a little bit to get maybe a better understanding of what Jesus is looking for in this transformational relationship. Here's what he says. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Start with those words, deny themselves. It means essentially die to your own desires. You put his plan, his purpose, his will ahead of your own plan and purpose and will. Another way to say it is it's complete surrender, giving up everything. If you're a military history buff like I am, you look back at some, read about some wars that were uh, where you would have these two countries that would battle and one country would be uh, winning the war, but they couldn't completely conquer the other side. And so you'd have the war would just drag on and the losses for both sides were pretty devastating. And so they would end with something called a negotiated surrender. And it's where one side surrenders to the other, but there's lots of conditions and terms. So the surrendering army has to be treated a certain way. Their leaders have to be treated in a particular way. The, the soldiers have to be allowed to go back to their family. They'll even negotiate the terms of like what land the victor can take from the, the conquered nation. It's surrender, but it's surrender with lots of terms and conditions and limitations. And Jesus has got no interest in that from us. He, he doesn't want our whole lives except our dating relationship. He doesn't want our whole lives but except our money and our free time. He wants to be more important than your work. He wants to be more important than your family. He wants to be more important than your money and your free time. If you look back, World War I was actually settled or it was a, there was a conditional surrender or this a negotiated surrender. Uh, but World War II ended with the unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan. And if you remember, know much about that, the United States and Russia went into Germany and the United States went into Japan. We controlled the government for a while. We decided how much military they could have. We had complete control because it was unconditional surrender. We could do whatever we wanted. And that's what Jesus wants from you. He wants to control every aspect of our life. You know, Chris talked last week about false prophets, and he talked about how churches will kind of water the gospel down to make it more palatable, a little easier to, to handle. And, and I think there's a tendency sometimes to think, well, that's just bad churches uh, that are leading you the wrong direction. But that temptation is there for every single preacher. It's there for me. We want you to follow Jesus. We want you to go to heaven because we truly believe that's what's best for you. And so there's a tendency for us to make it a little more palatable, a little easier to accept. You just, just do these few things. You just say this prayer, and everything's going to be okay. And, and I think that's what's happened in so many churches today. We've replaced the invitation of Jesus to come deny ourselves with this invitation to come and be happy, to come and find personal fulfillment, to come find satisfaction. We, we've made it all about us. We've made the salvation process about us. We're the center of everything. 
And that's not right. Jesus is the center of everything. He is the reason. We've spent so much time talking about the benefits of salvation that we've forgotten about the requirement of sacrifice. And and so our relationship with Jesus has become transactional. I say this prayer, I do this thing, and I get to go to heaven, and that's the way it works. And here's what's true. If we follow Jesus, we do get this amazing eternal life. But there is no eternal life without death. There just isn't. Remember what we read about Jesus' message from last week. Jesus said, there's a lot of people that at the end of time are going to show up and go, Jesus, look, I did all this cool stuff for you. Remember what I did? And what did Jesus say? Depart from me. I never even really knew you. Jesus is not interested in a transactional relationship where we do some stuff for him. He wants a transformational relationship where he becomes the most important thing in our life. There's a book called Raving Fans. It was written by a, name, a guy named Ken Blanchard. And it's about businesses and how to be successful in selling products. And so he tells these businesses that you've got to make your customers feel important and happy. You've got to make your product easy to, ex- to access. And you've got to make it convenient. And that makes perfect sense. If you're running a business and you're selling a product, you'd want to do those things. But the problem is churches have begun to do the same thing. And so we make it feel like a consumer transaction, that it's all about us. We go to church for us. We worship and and sing praises to God for us. We've made it kind of a store where you go shopping. What do we even call it when you're looking for a church home now? Your church shopping. And and so you come to the store and we show you, look what we've got for your kids over here. Look what we've got for your students over here. Look at all the convenient service times we have. We've even got online options. And look, you need to find a church that's right for you. And we want to be a church that offers you programming to grow in your faith. But we have to understand that it's not about us. It's about Jesus. The problem for churches when we do this is what we won them with, comfort and convenience, begins to be what we won them to, comfort and convenience. And so we have Christians that think that Christianity is all about being served rather than serving. We try to make following Jesus look as easy as we can, and then we measure our success by how many customers show up on Sunday morning. But that's not how Jesus measured success. He was not interested in customers. He wasn't interested in a casual relationship. He wanted committed followers who were completely consumed and transformed by him. And at some point, we have to decide where do we really stand with Jesus? What's our relationship? Do do you see the disconnect that's happening between what churches can tell us and what Jesus was saying? Churches say, whatever you want, you can get it here. Jesus' message is, give up everything. It's a very different message. We replace the message from Jesus the King to deny ourselves, really with the message of Burger King. (laughs) Have it your way here at church. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to someone about trying out a new church, and they'll say, you know, I went to the worship service, and it really didn't do much for me. And they missed the point. And I'm going to be honest, that was me 20 years ago. I I went to church, I did things because I wanted Jesus to do some things for me and my family. It was transactional. We do not worship Jesus for us. He is the king of the universe, and he deserves our praise. Jesus isn't a ticket to heaven. He's the Lord. We have to submit to his authority. Let's be honest. Who, who doesn't want eternal life? Like, sign me up. Who, who doesn't want salvation? Sign me up. If all I've got to do is sing some songs and say a few prayers here and there, I'm in. But at some point, Jesus is calling us to something much deeper. He's calling us to, to a relationship that transforms and changes everything about us. To love him first, to put him first, to serve him first. All right, look at the second part of what Jesus says in verse 23. He says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must take up their cross daily and follow me. That sounds kind of poetic, kind of beautiful to us today because we're thinking of a little piece of jewelry or we're thinking of that cross back there behind me. But that's not how Jesus' listeners would have seen this. They would have seen the cross as a bloody, dirty instrument of torture and death. Remember at the point that Jesus was saying these words, he hadn't died and been resurrected yet. So the cross did not represent resurrection and life. The cross represented suffering and death. 
And so they would have understood this idea of carrying their cross that they would literally take up the instrument of their death and they would have to carry it. If you think about like old Western movies where they'd make the guy dig the grave and then they'd shoot him and put him in it, that's what they would have thought of. That's the image, this idea of sacrifice and suffering. That's what he wanted to create in his listeners, this understanding of what it took, the sacrifice that it took. Let me ask you a tough question. What does following Jesus really cost you? Think about it for just a minute. What what, what does it really cost you? A number of years ago, MSNBC did this news article about a new kind of vegetarian. They're vegetarians, but they want to eat meat on occasion. It's just a little different. They want to be vegetarians, but they, they like meat. And they interviewed this young lady who was kind of the, I guess, the poster child for this new kind of vegetarian. And she said, you know, I'm a vegetarian, but I sure do like bacon. <laughs> we can't blame a girl for that. Bacon's good stuff. And she said, you know, I'm a vegetarian unless filet mignon is on the menu. All right. You know, I can't blame her for wanting to eat, eat some meat. And, but as you might imagine, vegetarians were not real happy with these new vegetarians that ate meat. And so they gave them a new name. It, it was called flexitarians. Look this up. You can Google it later. Don't do it now. I'm preaching. But later, go look this up. They're called flexitarians. And that means they don't eat meat unless they want to. I realized I'm a flexitarian. I won't eat meat well, every meal. And that's okay. I understand the desire to eat meat. But what you need to understand is... Flexitarians are not vegetarians. And I think the same is true for some of us with being a follower. We're we're flexi followers. We we want to follow Jesus, but we're not real interested in sacrifice or inconvenience. We we want to love Jesus, but we don't really want him to tell us how to spend our money. We, we, We love the church, but we don't want to serve with the church. We don't want to serve our community around us. We we love Jesus and we want to follow, but we want to Submit to him on the way he tells us that we should live life and how sexuality should work. Or tell us to forgive people that have hurt us. We're just not interested in that. But here's the tough, upside-down truth from Jesus. There is no such thing as a flexi follower. Either Jesus is your Savior and Lord, or he is neither. He cannot be one without the other. He's not interested in that. There is no salvation without sacrifice. That's what it looks like to be a follower. Jesus has no interest in a casual transactional relationship with you. He wants you to be consumed and transformed. He he isn't calling you to come to church. He's calling you to become part of his church, to love the community around you, to love one another, to share your faith, to serve in a sacrificial way. He, He wants us to love him more than our jobs, our habits, our free time, our families, our money. He wants to be first. He wants us to take up our cross every single day. But here's the crazy cool thing. If you actually decide to do that, to be transformed by Jesus, it will change everything. If you remember the the very first week of this sermon series, we were talking about the Beatitudes. You guys remember that? And the very first Beatitude, I told you, kind of summed up the entire Sermon on the Mount. And if you could understand that first Beatitude, you could understand the rest of Jesus' upside-down message on the Sermon on the Mount. Look look back at that first Beatitude. It's chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? It means that we are desperate for God. That we recognize that we can't do enough good stuff to earn his approval. We can't be good enough. We are desperate for a relationship with God. We ought to pray to God, God, I I can't be the husband or the wife you've called me to be. I I can't be the, the parent that I need to be for my kids. I can't be the leader at school or in my business that I need to be. I can't be the follower you've called me to be. I can't be the Christian man or woman you've called me to be. But God, you can, and I give it all to you, put you in charge, and with your help, I can do it. I want to ask you a tough question, and I want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about it. How many of you really only pray when you need something from God? You you pray when you're desperate, right? On a normal day, you don't pray much or maybe at all, 
But when something goes wrong at work or one of the kids gets sick or you're struggling with something or the finances are a mess or your marriage is messed up, you, you start praying. Prayer is transaction. You, you, you don't pray when you're not desperate, but you pray when you're desperate. I want to tell you what I think the secret is to improving your prayer life. The key to improving your prayer life isn't to learn to pray when you're not desperate. It's not it. The key is to always be desperate. We should have a desperation for God as individuals. We, we should have a desperation for God as a church. That should be our normal state. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. You remember in the first Avengers movie, uh, all the aliens are coming through the wormhole and there's that big alien ship coming and Bruce Banner rides up on the motorcycle and he's walking towards the, the big alien ship and Captain America says, it's time to get angry. What does Bruce Banner turn around and say? Here's my secret, Cap. I'm always angry. That's a good lesson for us. As followers of Jesus, we should always be desperate. Desperate for Jesus to put him first. Put his plan, his purpose, his power before our own. That's what it looks like. Look, look at what Matthew said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is how Matthew sums up this, this moment. He says in Matthew 7, 28 through 29, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Suddenly, everybody understood, this guy's not just another teacher of the law. There's something different about this man. There's something different about this Jesus. And, and what they realized is this was tough, tough teaching. It's very upside-down teaching 2,000 years ago. It's very upside-down teaching for us today. But here's what's even bigger. It was completely transformational teaching 2,000 years ago, and it's still transformational teaching today. It can turn our world upside down. I don't know about you, but I've been impacted by the last six weeks going through this upside down message. As I've been studying to prepare to, to teach to you on the Sermon on the Mount, these upside down words of Jesus, they've transformed me in some ways. I pray for this church differently than I did when I started this series. I pray for God to show up. That's my biggest prayer. I, I realize that sometimes I have a tendency to, to soften the gospel because I want you guys to follow it. I want everybody to be a Christian. But that's not Jesus' message, and I've been convicted by that. I, I've been convicted that sometimes I'm more worried about how many people show up Sunday morning than I am whether God shows up on Sunday morning. Jesus has revealed some sin in me that I didn't even know was there through this Amazing upside down message. That's how it works. That's how the process works. Jesus is constantly transforming us to look more and more like him. And the same thing should happen to you when you hear these words of Jesus. Whether you've been following Jesus for 50 years or you're just here checking out this whole church and Jesus thing, it ought to turn your world upside down and transform you. Look, we're all in this together. We can never be good enough to earn God's approval. We, we can't follow enough rules to earn God's approval. We can't do it. We all are in desperate need of salvation through grace. That's what it looks like to be poor in spirit, to be desperate for God. We're all in this together. If you're struggling, you're no different. Let, let me ask you a question. I do want you to raise your hand. Who here struggles with sin? Raise your hand. Get them up high. Look around. If you didn't raise your hand... You struggle with lying. That's one of, your, one of your sins. We're all in this together. And that's the good thing because we're all works in progress. But when we come to church and we put on that mask that I was talking about at the beginning where, where I'm great, we're great, family's great, everything's great, we're awesome. You cannot be fixed by Jesus if you don't come in and acknowledge your brokenness. We want to be a place where you can do that because we're all in this together. On Facebook and social media, we put on this mask that everything's awesome, and that's okay there, but it's not okay in church. You know, there are churches out there that say they love their students, but then when a girl gets pregnant in their youth group, they ask the family to leave the church or to step down out of the youth group. That's not who we are. We have to understand our brokenness to be fixed. We all have issues. We all have things. And we want to help you be changed and transformed by Jesus. Here's the reality. If you don't come in broken, you cannot be fixed. I'm still broken. 
I'm a lot better than I was 20 years ago, but I'm still a work in progress, and so are you. And, and so how do you become transformed? How are you transformed? For those of you that aren't a Christian, that aren't a follower of Jesus, you believe that Jesus is the God of the universe who died to save you and rose from the dead. You repent of your sins and you commit to follow after him and then you're baptized. That's how you're transformed. There's some of you here that there's no question that you're a Christian, but you're struggling with some sin in your life or you're just struggling to give Jesus a part of your life that keeps you from fully following him. We want to be a place where we can be open about those things, where we can help you grow in that, overcome your struggle and be changed. We're all in the same place. We're all broken. There's not one of us who's got it all together. We, we still struggle to keep from slipping back into some of our old habits and sins. And so we understand where you're coming from. We need to be a church that's desperate for Jesus. I've loved that I've seen us become a more desperate church over the last few weeks, even through this series. I want us to be a church that is a praying church. You see, the altar is pretty new, and we've been using that. I've loved to see us passionately praying. We've been praying that God would bring revival, not just to this church, but to this community, to this country, to this world. I want us to do that. I want us to be a church that confesses our sins regularly to God and even confesses our sins to one another on occasion when we need to and forgives one another. I want to be a church that loves one another like Jesus and serves the community around us selflessly. I want us to be a church that's desperate for Jesus. I want us to be a church that has a transformational relationship, not a transactional relationship where we show up on Sunday mornings, feel good about ourselves because we sang a few songs. I've also been praying for you guys individually. I've been praying that through this upside down message of Jesus, this Sermon on the Mount, that that you'd be changed, that you'd be transformed, that, that some of your ideas would be turned upside down, that, that some of your priorities would be turned some upside down, some of your relationships would be turned upside down, even that your religion would be turned upside down. The reality is it takes a lot of work and sacrifice to build a house that you want to live in, built on a firm foundation. It, it's a whole lot easier just have a house that kind of looks okay from the outside but isn't built on a firm foundation but at the end of the day at the end of your life you've got to ask yourself which house would you rather live in let's pray